A year of change at the PUC here on Energy 808, the cutting edge, uh, with my co-host Marco Mangelsdorf and Leo Asuncion, a commissioner on the Public Utilities Commission. We are really going to dig in and find out some stuff today. Right, Marco? Why don't you introduce Leo? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, my co-host there, Jay Fidel, and thank you so much, Leo, for joining us yet again on uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. So uh, always so pleased to have you on. So uh, mucho, mucho mahalo. Glad to be here, folks. So the first question, Leo, is do you miss Jay Griffin already? Uh, <laughs> I know you just saw him a little while ago, but and you work with him every day, but in, soon enough, he's going to be gone. Do you, do you have palpitations? Um, I do not. I, I will tell you that much. And part of it is, you know, I've been around enough times to see appointees come and go. Um, it's, kind of, it's part of the nature of, of the work of being an appointee. But, uh, you know, Jay's still here till June 30th. Uh, we have a lot on our plates to try to get done by then. Um, and, um, you know, and there's going to be stuff that is going to go beyond June 30th that we need to get done by then <laughs> but yeah well uh, can you tell us some of the things that have to happen yeah we have a couple of uh, decisions on some dockets that need to be made um that's uh, an effort because uh we want to do it with the current commission makeup uh it does not do any uh justice or any there's no reasoning to to extend it because that just means Right, the new commissioner, who we'll talk about a little bit later, um, right, will have to catch up on everything. I mean, you have to review an entire record, and that's not that's not fair. It it, it, it takes some time. I've been in that position to to review entire records in order to make a decision. But um, right, if we can do it in the period of time that we still have left, but I mean, we got sixty days basically um, to to do what we need to do and, and finish up. Right under under Jay's uh, administration. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's what strikes me from this discussion that, um, you know, every time you have a change, and it's always a political appointment change, um, you have this problem, um, and it, it's 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 got to be somewhat disruptive, even if in the sixty days you. Jay finishes off, you guys finish off everything that was pending with him, where he's familiar with it. You still have, um, you know, a d disruptive event when you have somebody new who hasn't served before uh, coming on the commission. Yeah. And, and that's why there are some people I know, Leo, who feel that appointments to the Public Utility Commission should be for life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thought I'd mention that. That's all there, Jay. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, you know, how, how do you how do you feel about the commission these days with the change? Uh, is the change of you know the uh, uh, you know uh, of uh, the chief commissioner going to affect policy? Uh, do you think it's going to affect the way the commission operates, um, the way it, its methodologies, uh, its its way of tackling these and addressing these problems? Yeah, I think um, uh, Naomi Kuai, who's the the nominee. Um, uh, she still needs to face a, a full Senate vote uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but you know, she brings she brings to the table, uh, I would say, unique, right? And and I look at it as uh, the commission, right, is starting to get into other things other than just utilities, right? Uh, we're we're being asked to look into environmental issues, sometimes land use issues, siting issues. Um, and, and the like. And, and Naomi brings that as being an attorney, right, as an administrative law attorney, but also very versed in environmental law and land use law, right? So bringing that to the table uh, will make us think a little bit differently, uh, make sure that we cover all of these. Like, I, I see it as issues that were never historically part, right, under the guise of the commission. But now we do have to think about all of these items, uh, right? We have uh, pending things like uh, uh, for water utilities, right? But how does that impact our water resources, right? So I can tell you that we've been working, say, with the Commission on Water Resource Management, right, to make sure that 
we got it all covered and we understand it before we make our decision right under our purview right uh, and and i think that's that's one of the future uh, for the commission right we're gonna have to work with our sister agencies uh, in the executive branch a, a little bit closer to understand the issues that they're having on their side um right everything from siting when we talk about you know solar farms right and and you're going to do it in agricultural land best place to do it but then you're impacting agriculture how do we how do we work and who do we work with then right do we work with the department of Edu uh, agriculture do we work with farmers stakeholders in the agricultural world so that's i think what nomi brings she, she's been involved in that for i've known her for almost 30 years Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and she's always been right as, as an attorney. Yes, in private practice, but then representing right clients and representing interests in say agricultural land use, right environmental, and the like. So I think right bringing that to the commission is, you know, kind of kind of breath of fresh air in this time that we're we're in and having to deal with a lot of the different issues, uh, not only utility. Right, it's kind of related. Yeah, well, I think you bring up a really good point, and that is the commission. Even though your terms are not that long, as we know, um, the commission has to follow the action. It has to follow the technology. It has to follow the state of the environment, um, climate change, for example, and all the things that happen around climate change, good, bad, and otherwise. And it has to keep current. With it, it has to be multidisciplinary. And your comments really suggest uh, to me that it is being multi this this Mary and this appointment will you know give it additional additional contact with additional subjects so that's 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 a good thing um, and, and and we are thinking of changing the name of the commission to the the public sustainability commission what do you think well we did. I mean, we do have public service commissions on the mainland, so <laughs> whatever that, that term covers. But then I will I will add, right, we've also been doing it with staff, right? Our staff is also right coming from different backgrounds, even though they're the typical analysts or e economists or the like, right? Their backgrounds and what they've been looking at also varies, right? So throughout our staff, we're trying to, you know, Kind of diversify the staff as well like right if they come with certain skill sets or they come with certain interests we try to make sure that they're helping us get that information stay up to date on things so i just wonder um you know that uh, I, I kind of know the answer but i'm just wondering that does does the governor consult with the other members of the commission uh when he's about to make an appointment i mean you know naomi but um, does the governor consult with you and say, Leo, you know, what do you think about this possibility? Did you ever have uh, that conversation with him? I I had a conversation with him when he had the slate of nominees, uh, right? So he was just about to go and interview with these people who are interested in being um, a, a, a PC commissioner. Uh, I will say, right, under, under Governor Ige, it's a very transparent process. Uh, he just he doesn't go around and look for someone. Uh, people have to apply. I don't know if you folks know that or the public knows that, uh, right? There, there's an actual website on the governor's website uh, for boards and commission, right? And it shows which ones are going to be vacant and who whoever's interested. You sign up online, right? So there were a number of applicants uh, that submitted their names to the to the governor for consideration. I had a discussion, I believe, a week uh, before he was ready to go to go out and talk to these guys. Uh, um, certainly, he can do that uh, at any time. He could have sure. right, went to talk to people and then uh, come to me or come to anyone uh, on his cabinet and go, "What about this person? Right? What do you think?" Right? And and, and I know the governor does that from time to time, uh, but in this case, uh, as far as you know, my personal involvement, it was before he even went and interviewed the slate of applicants. That's good. That says a lot of good things about, about him and you. Marco, are you disappointed you weren't on the list? No, Jay. No, no, not at all. Not at all. 
<laughs> okay. Well, uh, Leo and I may, may, be, may be disappointed. We're not going to say anything, though. Um, Marco, why don't, you, why don't you take over on, on the Q&A here um, before we come back and ask Leo um, about, you know, the, 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 the stability of the grid in face of the possibility of cyber attack. Sure. But let's, let's, let's uh, whatever you have on your mind, why don't you ask Leo now? So I'm just going to kind of take it from the, the political perspective. I watched the hearing last uh, Wednesday in the Senator Baker's uh, CPN committee. Mm -hmm. And when all is said and done, it was a four to one vote to approve with the sole nay vote from Big Island Senator Joyce San Buenaventura with a couple of uh, excused of senators who uh, did not vote. So uh, my assumption is based on that vote is that the Senate leadership, the majority leadership appears to be backing Ms. Kawhi's uh, nomination. So likely there's gonna be a vote either, it has to be really either this week or next week because the legislature of course is winding down and they would take over, she would take over if everything goes smoothly for her by on uh, July 1. So uh, I wanna kind of riff a little bit off of a question that Jay asked you, Leo, which is, this is the first time in, in a number of years uh, that there's going to be an attorney on the commission in the form of Naomi. And I'm wondering what, what effect do you think, what impact will it have on the commission to have an attorney back on board? I mean, in past years, there's been no shortage of attorneys that you and I both know over the years and the, the, the commission has been, uh, shall we say, attorney light, L-I-T-E, uh, with you and Jenny and Jay. So with the addition of uh, Naomi as an attorney, what, what difference do you think that will make, practically speaking or uh, administratively, to have an attorney back on the commission? I think for us, uh, it, it's, it's like a sounding board Right, because we do have legal staff, right? We have a chief counsel and there's about uh, six or seven attorneys that right, support her and support us uh, in different matters. Um, but having someone on the commission itself um, is very helpful, right? As someone that kind of like another voice, uh, right? Of, of, and legal thinking, uh, which we should take into consideration, right? Um, like I said, right, Naomi comes with 30 years of experience, right? And, and yes, it's not, uh, the majority ha has been in, uh, you know, uh, land use and environmental and administrative law. Uh, you know, she has a few utility clients, but they're mostly on the telecom side, right? Which is another one of our, our areas that we need to take a look at. Uh, but really, right, having that legal background uh, kind of is like, a little bit of a sounding board for our legal staff, mm -hmm. right? To make sure and validate, right? Which way we're going, uh, which way they recommend versus, you know, have you thought of this, right? Kind of, kind of back and forth on the legal side. I think uh, for us, right? Uh, I'm more of a policy person versus being a legal person, right? I look at it through that lens, right? Uh, Jay and Jenny, right? They kind of look at it uh, both from the researcher academic side, but also, right, for Jenny having worked at SMUD, uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, right? Um, we have all these different kinds. We're not legally minded, like you said, Marco. I, you know, I, uh, I, I will say when, when I was appointed um, back in 19, uh, right, I knew I was replacing, right, uh, former chair Randy Wasson. And my first question to the governor, when he asked me, would, you, would I consider coming to the PC was, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> right? My, my mind automatically went to, um, right? The way the commission is set up, right? You should have an attorney, right? Up in front or, or on the commission, uh, like you had before, right? Under Randy, you had also Lorraine Akiba, right? Who was an, an attorney. Uh, and then you had Mike Chappie, right? Um, so I think, I think it brings a uniqueness, I think, uh, for, for everyone on the commission, uh, as far as how we look at uh, pretty much the legal side of our decision, that would be, you know, something that Naomi will bring. Uh, but I think, you know, you still get uh, kind of openness, uh, right, from Jenny, from Jenny and myself, right? We're, we're a little bit broader 
focus. Uh, yes, we do have to pay attention to the legalese a little bit, but right with Naomi coming on board, I think right she can kind of handle that side of it and and inform us, right? Like you know, this is what's happening out there, right, in the legal world, mm -hmm. and how that translates to our decisions. So. Uh, Leo, if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe that Governor Ige has tipped his hand as to who he can choose without any Senate uh, advice and consent, who he wants as the chair of the commission. Do you have any insight into that? I mean, I guess kind of obvious question is, would you like to be chair? Uh, you know, that I've been asked that. I think, you know, I leave that to the governor, right? It's the governor's prerogative. Uh, the the typical way is right. You, he has three names, right? And I think that's that's his focus, right? He, he needs one. He needs the third name, which is Naomi, right? And then he can make his decision on who would be chair. Um, you know, I think any of the commissioners could be um, could be the chair, right? Uh, you know, if you look at time on the commission, right, it would be Commissioner Potter. Right. If you if you look at it another way, depending on how the governor thinks, um, right, um, what the commission needs, what kind of leader the commission needs, um, he can look at it that way as well. Uh, I think it's very different, right? Because um, when Jay was named as the chair, right, uh, Randy had already retired and left. Right. There was actually no chair. Right. There was God, and at, at that time. Uh, when the governor appointed me to the PUC, I was still at the Office of Planning, right? I didn't get here until after my confirmation hearing. So, right, the, the governor couldn't have waited, right, until the end of session to, to name a chair because we would be five months without a chair, right? Uh, so, hot, right, in that case, he named, he named Jay. They were operating with two commissioners until I got here. Right in May of 2019. So, uh, right this this in this case, right Jay's not uh, his last day is June 30th. Right, so you have a chair until June 30th. And so, right uh, when he does that, I, I know he acknowledges that there needs to be some transition time. Uh, so my best guess, and this is just my opinion, he'll probably do it sometime in late May, maybe the beginning of June, mm -hmm. and then. Mm -hmm. By, by then, right, should Naomi be successful, that's the third name. He'll look at the name, and then he'll decide on who will be the chair. Well, there's no time to waste. I mean, in the sense that you're having a transition, there are a lot of issues, uh, not only the ones that Jay has to work on before he leaves, you know, but um, there are other issues before the PUC. And I wanted to cover one. Make me uh, an ordinary citizen, knowing very little about this, um, and I watched 60 Minutes last night at 6 o'clock, and the number one segment, which was scary enough to lose your hair, look what happened to me, look what happened, uh, was, is that, is that um, you know, they believe, the intelligence establishment in Washington believes that if uh, Vladimir Putin uh, feels he's losing the war, or he finally understands he is losing the war, he's going to go to the next step, and the next step could easily be um, cyber attacks, because he's good at that. He's done it before. And cyber, the, the primary target, they said, in this segment is utility companies around the United States. And uh, although we're far away, uh, we might, we're not a big target, you know, we're a small utility uh, company in Hawaii, um, we could be on Vladimir Putin's list. So I'd like to know your thought and maybe your feeling about um, you know, it, uh, whether this issue is something that the Public Utilities Commission, you know, can can do something about um, on the possibility that we will be cyber attacked and our and our grid will be brought down by our friend Vladimir in Moscow. Yeah, you know, ironically, right, you, you saw it, what, a week, two weeks ago, right, there was a cyber attack on our, our telecom side. Right on, on the cable. So yeah, you know, it is possible. I think that you know, put aside that part, right? It is possible. Um, we actually have been um, trying to work with all of our utilities over the years. I, I remember when I came on board, right? I 
I got to go up to Paycom and listen to what Paycom had to say about cybersecurity, right? And what they're doing uh, to make sure, right, on, on a national level, uh, especially out here in the Indo-Pacific. And, and, you know, Hawaiian Electric and all the utilities that were already, right, there at the table saying, this is what we're doing uh, within the company itself. Uh, what, what we're doing right now, uh, we just got, I think a couple of weeks ago, right, kind of communicate from the White House, right, asking, right, what has PEC been doing in terms of cybersecurity, right? So, um, right, we're already kind, we're, we've been talking to, you, to the utilities, we have a couple of briefings coming up, we've had a couple of briefings already, um, and, and we're not only focused on, uh, say, the electric utility grid, but really everything else, right? I mean, I remember, uh, you know, I, I made a I, I made a call out to Young Brothers. Like, what are you guys doing cybersecurity on the ports, right? Because it's going to move commerce, and we need we need the ports there. And, um, and Young Brothers, and I think they're doing it through DOT, right? Uh, they have cybersecurity measures, right, going on at the ports. So it, it's all over. It's all of our utilities, right? Where uh, I'm sure, right, our small water and wastewater companies, right? They have SCADA and they have the like. They have right the, the infrastructure there to to you know monitor these things, uh, and I gotta believe and and subject to check right. I haven't we haven't talked to all of our utilities yet. Um, they pretty much have plans in case right it happens. Um, now, well, right? I mean, is it within the purview of the PUC to say uh, this is this is please satisfy us? You know, t talking to the utilities. Please satisfy us that you're doing what you know the military, the intelligence community wants you to do, and and uh, and we will we will opine on that. We will say whether we think that's adequate or not. Whether we think you know you should be doing something else. Uh, whether we think you know the public can be reasonably comfortable about this. I mean, yeah. you do you do have authority in this area, right? Yes, we do have authority to ask our utilities or investigate our utilities. Um, I think there's a fine line on, on, on how much is state involvement versus federal involvement, right? Likewise with the counties, right? I mean, they have infrastructure as well, right? Like our, our local water supply, right? It's all run by our respective counties. So do they have, right? In case something happens to their utility, do they have the plans? I think, <clears throat> I think the most we can do at this moment is really make sure that our utilities are prepared, right? That we have something in place should something happen, right? Because, right, these are all critical utilities, right? And if, if you look at the energy sector, well, the energy sector and electricity, right? You need it to run other things, right? Other critical infrastructure. So. Um, yeah, but it's, not, it's not the only critical um, function, I mean, or critical risk. As you, you know, we also know that, um, you know, the, the, the termination of coal on September 1 has risks attached, the possibility of brownouts or blackouts. Uh, you have spoken, you, the commission, uh, has spoken about that a number of times. And, of course, um, we have climate change, which could create any day of the week extreme weather that would, you know, tear our system up. And so, uh, how do you how well do you sleep at night, Leo? Um, I don't know. I get about four hours. <laughs> I've, I've, my body has adapted to four to five hours of sleep. Um, uh, you're doing it for us. We know that. <laughs> so, Marco, you have any comments or questions about these areas? Yeah, I do. I want to take a little bit different slant. Uh, number one. In my opinion, there is no country that has greater offensive cyber capabilities than the United States of America. And Moscow knows that. So I just, in fact, saw a new phrase not too long ago. You and I are of a vintage, Jay, perhaps Leo as well, to know what the acronym MAD stands for, as in mutual assured destruction, when you have nuclear weapons in enough quantities and enough sides that if there's a large scale nuclear exchange, nobody wins. So the, the slant on that I heard recently is mutually assured disruption 
mutually assured disruption, that if you have a significant cyber attack of party A against party B, then retaliation is pretty much uh, locked and loaded and it's going to happen. So I, I, I'd like to believe uh, 60 minutes aside that there's going to be great reluctance in the part of Putin to really go heavy against U.S. assets in terms of the cyber attack. So with that said, I just want to dramatically shift gears here uh, before we wrap up, please, Leo, which is, you know, all uh, ratepayers, all consumers in Hawaii are keenly aware of the cost of energy these days, both at the pump and also when they look at their Hawaiian electric bill. And my question to you is, uh, is there much of anything that the PUC, which is to look after the interests of the public, that the PUC can do in light of and to try to alleviate some of the pain of these record high electric costs. And, you know, FYI, uh, on the Big Island, uh, the electric rate right now is between 44, 43 and 47 cents a kilowatt hour. That's residential. And I wouldn't be surprised if when the May rates come out, we hit 50, which is, you know, a record. So is there anything more conceivably that the commission can do to to help struggling consumers with energy? Yeah, you know, well, part of that is the fuel costs, right? And you see the fuel costs just rocket and the like. Um, yes. We're back to but, Putin again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's, that's right. You're right. And um, I think, right, we are trying to accelerate, right, getting renewables on the grid, right, to try to balance out that crime, but then you on, on that side, and I don't know if you're seeing it, Marco, uh, but certainly like the commercial solar, right, um, utility size, utility scale projects, right, they're running into supply chain issues, right, and, and we're back to COVID, right, I think we discussed this a couple months ago, right, that that, that supply chain is broken or at any, 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 any piece of that link, right, Shanghai shuts down, People can't get the parts, right? They can't deliver batteries, panels, whatever on time, right? Then there's an ongoing US Department of Commerce uh, issue going on. I mean, this whole thing is, uh, in my mind, how do we, um, for the near term, kind of manage through this, right? And, and make sure that we take care of reliability, see if we can reduce rates more, see if uh, right fuel prices are going to come down right do we have in, you know information or intelligence on that um and the like and then then we got to focus right on the mid to long term right because at some point the cycle is gonna fix itself and we got to get back on it right and hopefully we we haven't missed right not so much critical deadlines but right that a year from now, we're gonna say, okay, we're, we're all good and shucks, we missed a year, <laughs> right? We, we didn't take advantage of it. So where can we take advantage of things uh, to give instant relief, but also look at the long-term, right? How do, we, how do we keep moving, right? I mean, we still got 100% by 2045, right? Being carbon neutral by that, by that date as well. And all the slew of initiatives that we have, Right, I think we still, nobody moved those dates out yet just because of what's happening today, right? So that, that's the challenge that we're all gonna have to face. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we talked about a little bit of the change in the commission. I think one of the things is for us to rethink, right? Where we go from here, right? I mean, could it get any worse? I don't know, but I think we really need to think about, right? How do we, get to right next year when AES coal on Oahu is down, right? Uh, how do we get to that next threshold, whatever that right, 20, what are they at? 2025, right, 2030 timeframe, right? Are we ready for that? How do we set it up for right beyond? Hmm. I have one more question before we run out of time, Leo, and that is this. You know, as we go down the pike, there are some things that need that that need help. That need incentivization, for example, in one way or another, tax breaks or otherwise at the, at the legislature. And um, you know, if if you're if you're in the commission, you say, "Gee whiz, um, we could really use some help here." 
in terms of changes in the statutory scheme for Hawaii that would move us faster and you know deal with some of the obstacles that we as commissioners see. Um, so is there a mechanism? Do you guys actually communicate with the legislature and say, hey, um, you know, how about an incentive for this or that or the other thing? How about, just I'm making this up, but how about an incentive for electric cars? Everybody knows that's good for us. Why don't you guys do something? Um, do you go down and testify? Do you write them letters? Do you, do you lift up the phone? Um, what, what do you do to motivate changes in the law that would advance these uh, community interests? Yeah, we actually do uh, talk with our legislators, uh, both on the House and Senate side, um, not only on ideas that we may have, but also ideas that they have. Right? Usually we work from the ideas that they have and try to refine it or make it better or make it more worthwhile. Um, that's, I mean, being a policy guy, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and it's just one of the ways that we can do it. Uh, but we certainly do that, right? We also try to work with our stakeholders, right? In, in say, the energy sector, right? I mean, we if, if they're facing, right, hardship, say, even at the county level, we go and try to sit down with the county folks and go, hey, you know, we really need this and we need to make changes and the like. Understanding that uh, most times it's on a going forward basis, right? You can't, it's hard to retro anything backwards nowadays. But I think uh, we certainly do that. I, I think we need to do more of it, in my opinion, uh, right? Because right at the legislature, you got 76 guys with ideas, right? And any one of them could be, right, the champion to try to move something forward, right? Not, right? I, I don't look at them as, as committees. Yes, that's one way. But how do we get, right? You got to get all of them involved, right? In, in or at least aware of, right, these initiatives that could happen to move, right, if, if it's going to get more renewable online, is it going to be, right, a more balanced portfolio uh, that we want to, that we want to seek for the future, right, what is it? And, and, and we certainly are prepared to do that. I think we need to do that. Uh, we have been doing it. Uh, I think the difficult thing, right, you know, Jay and, and Mark are right, we're going to have a new legislature. We're going to have a new administration come January, <laughs> right? I think, right, that that kind of weighs on my mind too. How do we, right, not so much get in early, but be at the door, right, ready to talk to them about this as we go into, say, next session. Yeah, glad to hear that. It, it sounds very positive, actually. And I hope you can continue and actually expand that effort to make them know what you know, because there's very few people, you know, in the state who know as much as you know, and who are presumptively impartial uh, as you are. So very valuable, uh, you know, dialogue. Okay, Marco, will you have any more? Uh, take some time and then and then Marco, it's going to be up to you to, to close this show, Marco. And, well, and to thank Leo, right? Uh, of course. Well, I mean, when you talk, when you start talking about things that are known, I can't help by channel by channeling, can't help but channel my inner Don Rumsfeld, who spoke uh, very loquaciously, if kind of uh, ambling sometimes in 2003 when he spoke from the the uh, podium at the Pentagon, and he spoke of the unknown unknowns. There are the known knowns, the known unknowns, and then there are the unknown unknowns. So. We, they're, they're always going to be unknown unknowns, but one of the knowns that I'd like to have confidence in, and I do, is that being on with Jay and being on with you, Leo, is known to be rich, useful, and always a pleasure. So thank you so very much. You're welcome. Anytime. You know that. Thank you, Leo. Really appreciate not only your coming you know, on the show with us and answering our questions, but your service at the PUC. Uh, we really appreciate your, your effort and your participation and your contribution to this very important uh, organization. Both.